Hey. What you doing? I'm Brandon Horwin. And I'm Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... My name is Debbie Gravett. I have one Tony Award, a Grammy Award certificate, an Emmy nomination. I've been in eight Broadway shows. I have two Drama Desk nominations, three children, one husband, um, let's see, uh, deceased chickens, dogs, and a cat. <laughs> and um, four CDs. Wait, I forgot to say that too. <laughs>We are so thrilled to have you on here with Whatcha Doing with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. Unfortunately, Sophie had a last minute exam um, reschedule today, so she will not be with us. But I do have some of her questions that she sent in for Debbie today, so um, that's great. But we are so thrilled and honored to have you on, so thank you for joining. I love when somebody says to me, Whatcha Doing? It's great. <laughs> Um, I was, and I was saying to Debbie when we signed on, it feels like ages ago that we worked together on a, the same Judy Garland concert that we discussed on this podcast fairly recently with Michael Berkowitz when he came on. And, and I, when I wrote to him, he said, I said, it was a few years ago. He said, no, it was last summer, Brandon. So, <laughs> time is really going. But I just wanted to ask you, can you take us through your journey a little bit on how you got to theater and basically, you know, from that point where you are today? Well, it all began, um, I grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised. And what's weird is that I never really was into TV and film at the time. All I, I was just, all I wanted to do is star on Broadway. And, you know, a very long story short, I, I actually did a show directed by a man named Gower Champion who went on to do, of course, 42nd Street, but he was very famous to begin with. And, um, from, and in that show, I was asked to audition for a Broadway show, never understanding that I got the show. They just, you know, they had to say, will you fly in and audition? So I got a Broadway show, which closed out of town, never even made it to Broadway. But I got my agent, this wonderful man named Bruce Savan. Um, I've had two agents my entire career, Bruce Savan and David Kladner. So I feel very lucky about that. Um, and I made my way to New York and basically eight months later, I got my first Broadway show, which was their playing our song, the original cast of their playing our song. Anyway. Eight months later, I got my first Broadway show, which was the original cast of their playing our song. And the great story about that is that I went, this was just for it to be, it's a cast of eight, but there's, you know, two stars and then three people who voice, do the voices for them, anybody who knows the show. And I, at the audition, Marvin Hamlish, I had to sing for Marvin Hamlish. And I sang, you know, Ain't got no trouble in my life. I got the music in me. I got the music in me. And he stood up in the audience and he said, anybody who sings that song is in my show. So that's how I literally got there playing our song. I'm sure there was more to it than that. But, and I, so I ended up being the cover for the lead for Lucy Arnaz. And then I just went, oh, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna be in the chorus anymore. And I just, so then I just started booking shows and in between shows, I would do like my cabaret act, um, which is very common now, wasn't quite as common back in the day. And I kept doing Broadway shows. And then I did a show called Jerome Robbins Broadway and I won a Tony award. And then they wanted me to do a series. And then I went to LA and I was married. And, um, and then we had children and I was doing Chicago on Broadway and I went, you know what? I'd actually like to see my children that I have birthed. So I sort of really, I had started in the concert world but I really sort of just 
did a lot of concerts, which is really what I've been doing the last few years. And then to go along with that, I started, I had a friend who was singing, we, we were in Moscow and she talked to me about a Whitney Houston show. And I said, I'm gonna help you do it. And then I started my company, which is now two years old, it's called Group Five Productions. And I basically book my friends all over the country and myself. Wow, that's excellent. Well, what an excellent- Oh, so what you doing? That's what I'm doing. Lots of great stuff. That's what she's doing. Um, great. And so you made your Broadway debut in They're Playing Our Song with Robert Klein and Lucy Arnaz. I mean, what a great group to be working. How did you feel when you were, you know, not only was it your Broadway debut in such a great show, but it was with that team of collaborators. Oh yeah, Neil Simon and Marvin Hamlish and Manny Eisenberg was the producer who would go on to produce uh, Jerome Robbins Broadway as well and a million other shows. But um, it was really, I remember opening night of, of they're playing our song and the feeling of, of this void because all I wanted to do was be on Broadway. And now I was on Broadway and I went, uh-oh, now what? So, you know, for anybody who's like wanted something so bad and you get it and then you're sort of like, well, now what? Right. So, so yeah, it was great. It was a great experience, obviously. That's great. And then you started to mention this, but your journey with Jerome Robbins Broadway. I mean, what a iconic team associated with that too. And I didn't know, I mean, I knew it was a musical review of his work, but I didn't know that until fairly recently that he did direct and choreograph the whole oh, thing. Oh yeah, it was all about him. Yeah. So how was that working with him? And- Oh, it was spectacular. I loved it. I loved it. We, we rehearsed for six months which was unprecedented at the time, unprecedented at the time, you know, for 64, a cast of 64 people. I mean, that was crazy, but he was very, um, he was very exacting. He was absolutely the best director and choreographer I've ever worked with, of course. He was brilliant, he was exacting. He brought the absolute best out of you. You had to constantly, we were sort of constantly auditioning all over again, every day. You didn't mark, you did not mark. You were always full out. And um, I loved every second of it. And of course, from Jerome Robbins Broadway, it was like, like the tree of life where all these people who are, you know, our new, you know, Jerry, Jerry Mitchell and Sergio Trujillo. I mean, like it, the list goes on and on the list of people from that show, how it branched out to Broadway. Right, so it really fostered growth and creativity and incredible careers from that yeah. moment. Yeah, I mean, we all love each other and it was quite an experience to have. We were all, you know, young and it was great. Wow, that's excellent. And all, you know, you talked about the pinnacle of a career being, you know, the build up to a, Broadway debut to an opening night, like, a, you know, something that everyone really strives and dreams of, but something that can even top that is winning a Tony Award. What yeah. was that moment like for you to, you know, even top making it to Broadway, but receiving Broadway's highest honor that night? Well, it's, it's, it's funny because on top of the Tony Award, which was of course, unbelievable, it, when when we didn't have the internet, basically, oh my God, it's unbelievable to even think about. But when you got the newspaper in the Friday section of the Arts and Leisure of the New York Times, every Friday they would have a Hirschfeld drawing of like some Broadway person. And that was like so incredibly special. And when I was nominated, I got a Hirschfeld. So not only did I get a Hirschfeld, but I got a Tony Award. Um, the weird thing is that it was pretty light year on Broadway in that year. And so three women from the Jay Lanier, Faith Prince and myself were all nominated for featured actress um, in a musical along with this other woman, Julie, famous cabaret singer. 
um, I thought for sure she was going to win. She had been around for a while. She was older. You know, we were all from the same show. So I thought we'd all split the vote. So I was really, as dumb as it sounds, I was really excited to just be nominated. But of course, once you're like just nominated, you're like, uh, uh, no, no, I want to win now. So that was great. Wow. Awesome. Really great. And, you know, so you've also had really extensive experience working in, in concert like reviews. I mean, one of them was a major production like Jerome Robbins Broadway, but you did one chance and chemistry. And I was looking up the list of folks that accompanied everyone on that stage is how, how are you talking about Frank Lesser? Yes, yes, yes. How was that night? It seemed like I, I just researched some more of it and it seemed like an incredible night. Was that when Paul McCartney sang? Yes. Oh, okay. My new best friend, Paul McCartney. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, oh my God, that was just fun. I mean, listen, we all do so many of those things that that's why I sort of was like, wait, which one is he talking about? But yes, yeah. Uh, that was an unbelievable night. Part of that was because, well, anything for the Actors Fund is a thrill to do and a sold out show is thrilling to do. And it had an incredible band and orchestra. And um, But um, right before my sound check, you know, this guy like walks in front of me. I'm like, hey, you know, it's my turn. And it turned, it was Paul McCartney. <laughs> so <laughs> we just had a little moment there. And then he just ended up being, you know, talking to us all about, you know, the Beatles. And it, it, he was just such a normal Joe until he left. And he had like, you know, 17, you know, guards on him. You know, that was weird, but a, a fabulous, another fabulous evening in the theater. It's, the th there's just nothing like being in live theater and the camaraderie and the sense of community. And I mean, that's, listen, that's what we're all missing right now. It's great to speak to you and Sophie, who's off doing her final right now, but you know, the fact that, you know, what we're missing is being next to each other and breathing together and sighing and laughing and crying. And I really, really miss that. Absolutely. And that's why, and I mean, it's incredible to talk about these experiences because some of them happened for one night, some that you were a part of. So to hear, you know, how they went down and, you know, to go through memory lane a bit is really awesome. Um, a question that I'd love to ask is, do you have a favorite show or can you pick a favorite show that you did throughout the years? Well, I'm going to, after all this time, I would, I'd have to say Jerome Robbins Broadway now. I mean, not only because I won the Tony Award, but because what it meant in terms of the theater and being directed by the man who created so many iconic shows that will forever live with us from Gypsy to West Side Story to Fiddler on the Roof. And, you know, take King and I, I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm gonna say that would be it. Excellent. And in 1994, you joined the cast of Les Mis on Broadway. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. As Fontaine? Yes, I did. At, at that point, who, who it had been running since about 87, if um, my memory serves me right for- I think when it, so, yeah. When it opened. So and so- At that time, they would, have, they would have like, you know, guest stars come in for four months, do like a four month run. Um, the funny thing about doing Les Mis was that I found out that I was pregnant with twins at the time. So I only lasted two and a half months and um, I was the really healthiest Fontaine ever because I was giving birth to twins a few months later. Wow, that is great. And who was in the cast at the time? Oh my God, I don't even remember. You're gonna say, who was Jean Valjean? Um, I don't even know. Because no it's such a revolving circle of people. And honestly, this is so selfish of me. I was so caught up in what was going on with myself because I didn't know I was pregnant. And then I found out I was pregnant and it was twins and that's like a to-do. Right, uh, absolutely. 
rightfully so. Um, you know, it's funny, a few times, uh, and it happens quite frequently, I'll be listening to Sirius XM on Broadway, and more times than not, you, your, your conjoint song with Faith Prince comes on, and then I, I'll see, like, you do an interview with Faith Prince. I know you were on Seth Radetzky's Stars in the House recently, so it seems like you two have a special bond that seemed to evolve from um, Jerome Robbins Broadway. Is that and true? And how have known her before that as well from, you know, just again, it's sort of like you were asking about that, the Frank Lesser concert, you know, we're constantly doing benefits and concerts and fundraisers and, uh, you know, so um, I had known Faith and she's an awesome, awesome human and just brilliant performer. Great. Um, so where were you prior, like right when COVID came into the picture in March? And um, following up with that, have you been able to adapt to an online format to stay creative or what have you been able to accomplish during this time? Um, so March, uh, March 6th, I had a concert in, uh, in Florida. I was doing a symphony concert and I came home on the 7th of March. On the 12th of March, they closed Broadway. On the 13th of March, I drove into the city and picked up my husband and my son came home who is doing Wicked, Fierro in Wicked right now. And he came home on Saturday, on Monday, my his twin sister came home. She was sick and it turned out that she, along with my son, had COVID right at the beginning. He, she was sort of really sick, but f absolutely fine. My son who had been in Wicked had a thing where like he couldn't taste or smell, which of course we know now is one of the symptoms of COVID. And then I have an older son who also ended up with COVID and everybody is absolutely fine. So it was a very quick, like sort of dive into the world of COVID. Um, a few months in and or a couple months in, I have this company, Group 5 Productions, and I told you I, you know, hire my friends and obviously really talented people. And I started thinking about how do I keep all this alive in between, you know, doing podcasts and doing, you know, shows, stars in the house and, you know, other things for people and recording a song here and there. And, um, you know, uh, I decided I came up with an idea to do a virtual show. And I know that's very common right now, but this was sort of at the very beginning of it. And I went to a venue and they were very excited about the idea of it. And then immediately I got a call from the Joe Kennedy the third campaign who was running for the Senate in Massachusetts. And they asked for me to put together a salute to Broadway. It was gonna be Broadway Sings for Joe Kennedy the third. And I called my friends, Kelly O'Hara and and Sarah Bareilles did it. I had, and we did this great, great online virtual show. It ended up not happening because for political reasons, but that's what sort of launched this series of shows that I did and put together with fabulous people from, you know, Seth Rudetsky actually just did one and, and Harvey Firestein and, uh, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a who's who people from Hamilton and, and Phantom and Lion King. And it's really, it's a fantastic group of people. And we now sell that to different venues. Wow. That's excellent. Yeah, it is excellent. And it's, it's kept, you know, a little money in the till and it's employed other people as well. I mean, it's a small stipend, but it's still, you know, I believe that we should, everybody should get paid when they perform. And, um, and some really, really incredibly creative stuff. And it's keeping folks engaged and creative. Yeah, and yeah. 
I, I have to, I did one live show, which actually wasn't live. It was streamed for the Harrisburg Symphony. I did my big band Broadway show with a big band on stage and, you know, everybody in masks. And then, you know, I went to sing, but they recorded it. They taped it multi-camera. So that's the only live show that I have done. Everything else has been taped. Wow. Well, I'm also grateful and glad to hear that your children are all healthy and have recovered and you and your husband stayed clear of the virus. We have stayed COVID free. We think, we don't know who knows at this point. Wow. But healthy, well, yes, good. knock on wood. That's good news because it had to be a little uh, frightening. At, to, um, at Yeah, well, we got tested or... right away, but we were fine. Good, good, good. good. Um, so how do you look back? This is, I, I like to ask this. I asked this of Michael too. How do you look back at the Judy Garland at Car Carnegie Hall, uh, you know, recreation concert in Asbury Park last summer, five um, incredible talents, including yourself with a over 40 piece orchestra recreating those incredible arrangements. How do you look back at that night? Well, I, it was a fantastic night. I mean, you cannot, it's so iconic, that concert. Of course, we're all too young to have been around for it. Well, you certainly weren't alive. I mean, I think, I mean, I was alive, but I, I had no reference. I don't remember it anyway. And um, it was one of the great, great historical concerts. Thank God they recorded it. I mean, obviously there's no video, unfortunately. I'm sure there's some snippets somewhere, but her arrangements and orchestrations are second to none. You just cannot beat those arrangements and orchestrations. And to get the opportunity to do that with the same size band that she used and incredible musicians. And then like sort of the five, you know, Judy's um, who were also very, very different. It was a spectacular night. I actually had the opportunity before um, we were in, I think Fort Myers and I did the entire show myself with a wow. orchestra with M Michael conducting as well. So I've had some experience with it. It's there is nothing like singing those songs, nothing. Wow, that's incredible you did it yourself too. I mean, you really felt exa exactly what she did at that time, unbelievable. It's, it, less the adoration part of it though. I needed <laughs> some more, you know, people in the audience, but it was it was really fabulous. Um, so this is a combined question. Where do you see Broadway going from here and the entertainment industry? And then what advice do you have for young artists and future professionals who are making an attempt to break into this industry during this um, kind of crazy time? What advice do you have for them to keep on going forward? Um, well, I think this is all just sort of one answer, but I think first of all, this sort of pause, because I do believe it is just a pause, is the most incredible time for anybody who wants to do what we do in show business to be studying, studying, working, working, working on everything. Learn to juggle, go to dance class. It's all online, it doesn't matter. Dance, keep your voice in shape, take acting classes. It's such a great time because here's the thing about our business. We, we get opportunities, but sometimes the opportunities we get come only once in a lifetime and you have to be prepared when they come. You have to have your materials together. You have to know what you're doing when you walk in that door. You don't wanna be caught short. There's so much talent in the world and there's so many ingredients that go into what makes a star, a working person. There's, you know, obviously there's technique and, and talent, but there's also a little bit of fairy dust that gets sprinkled on people. And that's why you're like, well, wait a minute, how come he got that? And you're like, because we, we don't know, there's all that, whimsy that surrounds it as well. So I personally feel that when we come back, 
when it starts up again, it's going to be like the Renaissance, the Renaissance. It's going to be, all of us have been just like building up to this time. There's gonna be such a creative outpouring of material. And I think it's going to be a fantastic time because I believe that one of the things that we are all missing, which we spoke about earlier, is that connection, that live connection, that kinetic energy when you walk into a theater, when we're all either on the stage or we're in the audience and that connection between those, those two. And um, I personally just, I can't wait until somebody says, come and perform in front of thousands of people and and it's gonna be the greatest day of my life. Can't wait for it. That's excellent advice. And I like, I, I like what you said too, because you don't wanna be the person that looks back at this time and says, gee, I, would, I wish I would have studied more or practiced more because the time is there. And That's I know it's hard not to be in person and with a group and you know, it's not the same feeling, but it doesn't mean that we can improve ourselves. Right, right. Great. Um, wrapping up, one more question about a show that I, I forgot to mention earlier is Zorba with Anthony <laughs> Quinn. How was that experience? Oh, uh, was, that was another great experience. I mean, I'd never worked with like, I'd worked with other stars, but he was, he was really, um, he was really something else. Uh, another great learning experience. Um, I, you know, another show I made lifelong friends in, um, you know, really fun to do. And another show that I, along with their playing our song and Jerome, Jerome Robbins Broadway, these were shows I got to do back in Los Angeles. So it was great to be able to do them for family and friends. That was a great, great benefit of that along with Zorba as well. Absolutely. Now, do you have a favorite story from all these years or uh, one or two that you just think of when somebody says, what's your favorite story from looking back? Well, you know what? That's a really hard thing to answer. Um, there have just been these incredible moments. I remember when we opening night of Jerome Robbins Broadway, even though the, the press, the you know, they, the press comes earlier in the week when you open a Broadway show for anybody who doesn't know. And if you know that, I don't mean to tell you something you already know, but on opening night, because sort of the community knew that we had rehearsed for six months and what a huge deal it was and Jerry Robbins coming back to Broadway. And um, I remember we came out and we just all sort of struck a pose when he first came out and the audience would not stop clapping. We hadn't done anything except literally come out to say welcome. And the audience would not stop. And uh, that was one of the more thrilling moments of theater that I've experienced. Wow. Um, congratulations on your incredible career and all of your successes. It's been really remarkable being able to go over it with you today and to hear, you know, from start to current, how, what you've accomplished, you know, fulfilling dreams, Tony Award, all of your incredible successes, nominations. And being one of the sisters in The Little Mermaid. Let's not forget that. Uh, absolutely. And you're at work, <laughs> we still work with Alan Menken quite frequently and, and one of your albums is all of his music as well. That's excellent. Um, is there anything else that we can promote on here for you today? Um, any, uh, I know all of your albums are currently on iTunes and Spotify and everything. And do you have a website that- um, I do, debbiegravit.com. You know, write to me, ask me questions. I love, I love when people reach out, you know, I'm happy to, talk, give advice, sing a song, whatever. Um, uh, you know, just 
just keep going, just keep going. We're gonna get through this. That's what I have to say. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible honor and thrill and an incredible time with you today. Thank you so much. You're so great. And I'm so glad to be a part of it. And now I know what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Debbie. Okay, take care. Okay.